Dear students, welcome to Bluepen Online. Shall we begin? Please use headset, pen and paper to take notes. Here you go. Please let's know your feedback after class. Back to our class on hematology. Continuing where we last left, that is clinical features of megaloblastic anemia. We move ahead next to investigations in megaloblastic anemia. The first and foremost is complete blood count. Second is RBC indices. Third is peripheral smear. And fourth is serum B12 levels. In complete blood count, what do we look for? We look for low hemoglobin, low WBCs known as leukopenia, low platelet count known as thrombocytopenia. When all three cell lines are decreased, it is known as pancytopenia. RBC indices indicate increased MCV. So the red blood cells are bigger in size. MCH that is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin is decreased. So the RBCs appear pale. When we get a smear done, if we take the blood of a patient with megaloblastic anemia and smear it on a slide, what do we see? We see large macro ovulocytes. Macro means large, oval shaped ovulocytes anisocytosis that is different sizes poikilocytosis that is different shapes and occasional teardrop cells we can also notice sometimes hovel jolly bodies which are nuclear fragments which are remnants inside the rbc but the pathognomic or very specific finding of b12 deficiency is hyper segmented neutrophils which normally neutrophils have three to five lobes but in megaloblastic anemia they will have more than five to six lobes so hyper segmented neutrophils is a very specific finding in megaloblastic anemia to confirm what do we do we get a serum cobalamin level done Cobalamin is the other name for vitamin B12. The diagnosis of vitamin B12 deficiency is made by finding an abnormal, abnormally low vitamin B12 serum level. Normally it is more than 200. But when it becomes 170 and below, patients develops overt B12 deficiency symptoms. And below 100, they are usually very symptomatic. So how do we treat megaloblastic anemia? We treat megaloblastic anemia by giving vitamin B12 injections IM. It can be given IV also, but since it requires a long term treatment, IM is a better choice. And the dose is usually 1000 microgram. If there is severe deficiency for the first week, you can give it every day, followed by alternate day for two weeks and then progress to weekly injections and then to monthly injections. Most of these patients require lifelong therapy. Vegetarian food is a poor source of vitamin B12. So whenever you suspect vitamin B12 deficiency, you ask the food habits of the patient. Once I start giving vitamin B12 to this patient, how do I know whether the patient is responding or not? I check the reticulocyte count which peaks by 5th to 10th day after starting the therapy. The hemoglobin raises slowly after one week. So you can't immediately see a reaction, but you will have to wait and watch for the increase in reticulocyte. With that, we complete two major topics that is iron deficiency anemia and megaloblastic anemia. We move on to the next important topic that is hemolytic anemia, which we shall cover in the following topics. And we shall concentrate on two important anemias that is thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So these are the two important topics we shall concentrate today on. So what is hemolytic anemia? 
hemolytic anemias are defined as anemias that result due to an increase in the re- rate of red cell destruction normally the red rbcs have a life span of 120 days premature or increased rate of destruction of circulating rbcs is known as hemolysis so a major feature in these anemia is that the red cell life span becomes very low as low as 10 to 15 days what is the issue when we develop hemolysis the first issue is breakdown of rbcs which when destroyed end up in the spleen therefore causing splenomegaly the second issue is the release of hemoglobin which gets converted to bilirubin leading to jaundice the third issue is a reactive bone marrow proliferation so because of constant hemolysis the bone marrow tries to compensate where exactly is the bone marrow it is within the medulla of bones so it tries to compensate by proliferating excess it begins to form lot of rbcs and it releases immature rbcs called reticulocytes and because it is hyperactive the bone expands this is known as bone marrow expansion so in a case of hemolytic anemia i will have splenomegaly jaundice reticulocytosis these are the three features of any hemolytic anemia so how do i classify hemolytic anemia the classification of hemolytic anemia depends on whether it is hereditary or acquired so if it is a hereditary it can be a problem within the rbc or it could be a problem because of the surface of the rbc or the rbc membrane abnormalities in acquired hemolytic anemia it could be a spur cell anemia seen in liver diseases or extrinsic factors like hyperstenism antibody mediated immune lysis mechanical trauma known as microangiopathic hemolytic anemia microangiopathic hemolytic anemia the last is infection and toxins so we shall today concentrate on hereditary hemolytic anemias like i said hereditary hemolytic anemias could arise from within the rbc if the rbc has abnormal components within it it 